Okay. In the name of God, most gracious, most merciful. Uh, this is a holiday for the Muslim community. It's a, a day of family and friends. Um, and in this pandemic, the mosques uh, are, are opening, but uh, the number of worshipers are limited. But uh, what we have here in America is religious freedom. It's by choice. Um, what's happening um, in what we all call the Holy Land is anything but holy. Uh, it is anti-human and anti-God. It's a violation of religious freedom. Uh, every Ramadan, it seems that there are uh, military and militarized law enforcement stampeding uh, the mosque in Al-Aqsa. And that is the one of the holiest shrines for Muslims, where we believe the Prophet ascended to the heavens to meet all the other Prophets and to underscore Abrahamic unity and that Islam in, in its essence is to protect the religion of all people, including those who don't believe in God. Uh, but human dignity is a cornerstone of all of our faiths, whether we're talking about Islam, Christianity, or Judaism. And so for the United States to be preaching, the United States government today is issuing a report on religious freedom in the world, but for it to preach religious freedom when it does not consider this to be one of the most important issues on religious freedom only means that it is losing more and more credibility in that world, especially when the United States government is financing uh, and protecting this outrageous behavior. And so we as Americans are coming together and we have different opinions. Uh, we are not here to say we're, we're having one position. There are many positions, but we're unified on the principles of justice. We're unified on the principles of religious freedom. We're unified on the principle that the people will force change because the governments are failing in affecting positive change to develop resolution, a resolution. And it is, it is also uh, a concern of ours that the narrative has shifted from what's happening in East Jerusalem, what's happening in Sheikh Jarrah, what's happening in the West Bank in terms of the military occupation to, well, why don't both sides just learn to get along and, uh, and, and, and have a ceasefire? That happens every time, and we don't get to really the, the core issues, which is the military occupation uh, of a whole people. And when you, when you look at this map, you see this map here. This was what we called Palestine in 1947. Well, you're, you're all familiar with this map, I'm sure. <laughs> and then what happened after partition, 1948. And then what happened, the green basically is the Palestinian population. And then what happened after the 1967 war. And now this is what's happened to the Palestinian population. And so the reality is whatever we say politically, whatever our government says, this in effect is ethnic cleansing of an indigenous population. And it behooves us as people of faith to stand up for the truth um, and, and speak on this issue. And then another map that I'd like to share is the settlements in and around East Jerusalem. And when we look at these dots, these are the Israeli settlements in and around East Jerusalem, which is under international law, Palestinian territory that the occupier cannot confiscate and, and, and um, cleanse the area uh, for its purposes. And that's exactly what's happening right now. And then what's happening in Gaza with Hamas firing rockets, it's reprehensible. Um, and what Israel has done in bombing an apartment complex, I believe now, and Hadad can give us the facts, um, what I read yesterday, 65 civilians killed, including uh, maybe up to 10 children, including, I'm sorry, 19 children as of this morning. Um, an old woman uh, was also uh, killed in, in these 
uh, bombings. So the, the suffering, obviously, um, is lopsided in terms of what the Palestinians have to suffer in dealing with this occupation. So we are here together to stand for religious freedom, to stand for justice, to stand against occupation, to stand against what Human Rights Watch now is calling apartheid. Um, and much like what happened with George Floyd, the government didn't react until the people forced the government to change. Um, this is what's going to have to happen here. The governments are not going to act until the people force a change. Um, and, and what was done to Native Americans um, and, and, and calling them Indian savages and wiping them out. What was done to black slaves, calling them animals and controlling them and treating them like animals. This is what's happening to Palestinians now. And we can't say if we only knew. We know. The question is if we can only act. And as the Quran says, act so that the prophets and God will be your witness and you will achieve your success if you act now. So with that, uh, I'd like to ask uh, our guests to comment. And as I said, my statements are statements of the Muslim Public Affairs Council. We are a family of interfaith leaders. Uh, we share a lot. And now that Ramadan is over, we're going to share more in food. <laughs> and now the pandemic is over. But we also share in our sorrow. Uh, over what's happening to our holy city of Jerusalem, a city that is um, supposed to be for all of our faiths, all religions. This is where God wants us to unite uh, under the family of Abraham. Um, so with that, um, I'd like to have uh, Arya, Rabbi, Rabbi Arya, since you were here first. <laughs> uh, just go ahead and announce your name and an affiliation. Oh, I'm sorry. I was Salam Al Mariyadi, Muslim Public Affairs Council. <laughs> Just for the record. Thank you. Um, thank you, Salam. Thank you to MPAC for calling this and inviting me. My name is uh, Rabbi Dr. Aryeh, A R Y E H Cohen, C O H E N, and I teach at the American Jewish University. Doesn't always happen this way because of the difference between the lunar and the lunar solar calendar. But Ramadan this year comes out just before the Jewish holiday of Shavuot. Ramadan is a month of celebrating revelation, and Shavuot is the Jewish holiday which celebrates the revelation. And the revelation is the revelation of the one God. The tradition says that the, the only thing that, God, that was really revealed at Sinai was, I am God. And that one God means that God is the God of everybody. The irony in Jerusalem is that when originally King David built the temple, he built the temple as a temple that everybody could come and sacrifice, for everybody to come and sacrifice, for everybody to come and pray to God, for all nations to come and worship together. This is not a religious war. We are standing here to say that this is not a, this is not a war between Muslims and Jews. This is a war between those who think they have a monopoly over the land between those who think that they are the only part of the only religious configuration that counts and those who think that there are many ways to worship God. Jerusalem, whether Jerusalem will be Ir Amim, a city of nations, or whether Jerusalem will only be a city that belongs to one people. This war, which is by now a war, unfortunately, started, and we forget already, not two weeks ago but years ago with the attempted displacement of Palestinians from the neighborhood of Sheikh Jarrah, also the neighborhood of Silwan, which as uh, Salam said, north and south of the old city, in order to, this is the continuation of the Trump plan to make it impossible for Jerusalem to be shared. Sheikh, the, there have been, and one of, the, one of the bright spots in this awful picture is that Palestinian, Israeli Palestinians and Israeli Jews have been working together against this displacement for years. The Israeli government has been working against that and for the displacement. 
and for these and and this this part of it is really what came along and was the tinder for the fire that 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 inevitably exploded the displacement of a whole community this is not the the claim that Jerusalem is is uniquely Jewish and not Jewish Muslim and also Christian this also clouds the fact that two weeks ago Human Rights Watch released a report I don't even know if it was two weeks ago time now is just nothing but it released a report that according to the legal definition what Israel is doing in, especially in the West Bank but also to some extent in Israel is apartheid right and that the, the clashes, the civilian clashes that are happening now in the cities is a result of that. Not a result of the report, but a result of the ongoing, decades-long oppression, suppression, repression of Palestinians, both Palestinian citizens of Israel and especially the Palestinians in the West Bank who are not citizens of Israel and have no rights as civilians. And so we are all standing here together united in the demand that the United States not sit on the sidelines. The United States not sit on the sidelines. The United States come in and demand that this be cooled off, that this stop. The United States and Egypt, who have been the traditional brokers of peace between Israel and Hamas. But more than that, the United States has the ability to come in and say, you know, we're done with the Trump era. We're done with making believe that Jerusalem will remain undivided forever. We, it's time to start realizing that Palestinians have rights in Israel, Palestinians have rights in the West Bank, and it's time to move forward. It's time for the United States to get off the bench and become involved. And so I just want to finish with the fact that Jerusalem, its name in Hebrew is, means the city of peace. And King David in Psalms said that those who pray for the peace of Jerusalem will themselves get peace. And we all pray for the peace of Jerusalem. But the peace of Jerusalem cannot be some abstract, cloudy thing. The peace of Jerusalem has to be the peace in the streets, the peace that lets people live in peace. Thank you. Mike. Morning. My name is Mike Kinman. My pronouns are he, him. I'm the rector, uh, senior pastor at All Saints Episcopal Church in Pasadena. Uh, I don't have much that I can add to what my brothers have said, uh, Salam and Arya, uh, other than to say I completely stand with them and support every word that they have shared with you. Instead, what I'd like to do, just very briefly, is, is share a story. Um, in uh, August of 2014, uh, Michael Brown was sh shot to death in the streets of Ferguson, Missouri. Uh, and that night, a community gathered to grieve and to pray, to grieve and to pray the death of one of their own, a basic human thing to do. And they were met by police in military gear who shot tear gas canisters at them. And one of the people there picked up the tear gas canister and took a picture of it and tweeted it out. And someone in Palestine saw that picture and tweeted a picture in return of the same tear gas canister that had been shot at them by IDF forces. And so what we learned from that is that the same people were training both the American police and the IDF. What we have either learned or probably not learned from the experience of Ferguson is that people need the chance to come together to pray, to grieve, to be together as a community. It is a basic human need and basic human decency says that we need to allow ourselves to do that. And when that does not happen, when, when we meet that community desire for love and support and grief, with militarized force, it only escalates the violence. What has happened at the mosque in Jerusalem is nothing new. 
It is a replaying over and over and over again of what happens when we do not respect the deep need of each other to gather together, to pray, to celebrate, to grieve. The struggle we have for civil rights in this country, a struggle that is ongoing, is deeply related to the struggle for civil and human rights going on in Palestine. The same tear gas canisters are being shot at both sides, and it is so important to note the same people are profiting on both sides. And so we are calling not just for an end to violence, we are calling for an end to the oppression that sparks the violence. We are calling to respect basic human decency, to give each other the space to come together, to pray, to grieve, to celebrate, and to recognize that when we deny each other that human decency, we deny the humanity in ourselves. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah. Uh, Assalamu alaikum. Greetings of peace, everyone. My name is uh, Hidab Tarifi. Uh, my name is Hidab Tarifi, H-E-D-A-B, last name Tarifi, T-A-R-I-F-I. -I. I'm with the Islamic Center of Southern California. But I'm also here as a Palestinian, born in Gaza, uh, born a refugee uh, in my own homeland. Um, every year as I prepare for Ramadan, looking forward to the spirituality, the prayers, uh, the uh, supplication, the calmness, uh, body, soul, and, and, and um, heart and mind, um, I also brace to what will be happening to my homeland um, and uh, brace for what my family who are in Gaza uh, would face during the month. Uh, sadly, this year was not any different, um, whether it's in Jerusalem or in, in Gaza. For a whole month, Palestinian worshippers were prevented from accessing the holy sites. The Muslims were not allowed and were attacked, brutally attacked, as they were going to Al-Aqsa Mosque to pray. But it wasn't just the Palestinian Muslims, so were the Palestinian Christians, who were prevented from accessing holy sites uh, during uh, the Easter celebration. And sadly, that happens every year. For a month, the media was silent. The world was silent. The leadership of the world was in a coma. Nobody, nobody, sadly, condemned what was happening in Jerusalem to the Palestinians. And then when the Palestinians started demonstrating throughout occupied Palestine, coming from all areas in Jerusalem, uh, and not just Jerusalem, but the rest of, of occupied Palestine, coming from Haifa, from Yaffa, from Al Lid, from Al Khalil, from everywhere. They all marched because they wanted to join their brothers and sisters in Jerusalem. In Gaza, the largest open prison, they couldn't really do the same. All of a sudden, Hamas started sending rocket, rockets toward Israel. And all of a sudden, the media, the world, woke up and the narrative shifted. Attacking Israel was a red line. Attacking Palestinians, that's okay. Israeli lives matter. Palestinian lives don't matter. That is the message I got and that is the message all people of faith who are standing for human rights and justice and for the Palestinians' rights to dignity, to living and practicing their faith like all other faiths. I said, no. Yet, all the focus of the media is now Hamas rockets on Israel and Israel's right for safety and security. What about the Palestinians' rights for safety? What about the Palestinians' rights to live normal life like the rest of the world? My family is in Gaza, and my family have been suffering 
in the last few days. I mean, thank God, none of them is injured, yet they are shaken, sleepless nights, the children crying, the children cannot sleep except with their hands on their ears, trying to um, close their ears to uh, the constant bombing. Uh, and yet, the world doesn't care about that. The world is not saying a thing to pressure Israel to stop their aggression, their upper tide aggression on Palestinians. I'm glad that my family are safe and not injured, but that's sadly not the same for many of my friends. My friend Daniel Madhoun, I talked to him yesterday morning. He was clueless that some of his family were injured. And as of this morning, sadly, the news came that they actually died from the Israeli attack. Arab Muslims, Arab Christians, and Arab Jews lived peacefully in Palestine until the Zionist movement that decided that, no, we don't want that. We have to take the land and make it Jewish only and take away the rights of the Christians and Muslims in the land. I appreciate all my friends around me here because these are the peacemakers. And I call upon all peacemakers in the world to stand up and call for Palestinian rights. I'm not going to call for the uh, world leaders because honestly, I lost faith in them mm -hmm. long time ago. Yes, and yes. I don't expect them to do anything. But it is us, the people, who care for the people who are in the Holy Land, who are calling for peace for everybody in the Holy Land. We are the one who can make the shift. Israel has no regard to any uh, any country, to any leadership except in this leadership. Why? Because this country is the only country that fill the bloodline for Israel. Israel cannot do what they do without the money that this country gives them unconditionally. I call for every person of faith, Muslim, Christian, Jew, even the non-Abrahamic um, uh, faith, uh, faith citizen of this country and citizen of the world, I call upon you all to say no, to demand that these, this, these funds stop and stop immediately. It is insanity to keep doing the same thing and expect different results. So calling on negotiation and calling on you know, the, the, the United States to uh, come down and bring, bring the, the, the Palestinians and the Israelis to the, to the uh, negotiation table, enough with that. It didn't work, and it's not going to work. The only thing that will work is to remove that immunity from the state of Israel and hold it accountable in front of the world. And that's what I ask for, for from everybody, and that's what I ask for myself. And as I end, I ask of all of you to pray for the people in, in Palestine. Pray the people, for the people in Jerusalem. Pray the people in, 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 um, in Gaza, because they are humans, and they deserve uh, to live peacefully, and their lives do matter. Thank you, and God bless. Thank you. Good morning. My name is uh, Reverend Dr. Reinhard Krauss, and I serve as the Executive Director of the Academy for Judaic, Christian, and Islamic Studies. We are here this morning, as has already been said, to draw attention and to speak out against the violence and the atrocities unfolding in the Holy Land. It is a land sacred to Muslims, Christians, and Jews. As a Christian, I'm standing shoulder to shoulder with my Muslim and Jewish sisters and brothers to condemn the injustice which is erupting in yet another cycle of bloodshed and suffering. Yesterday, President Biden said this about the current round of atrocities in the Holy Land. My expectation and hope is that this will be closing down sooner rather than later, but Israel has a right to defend itself. With this statement, President Biden captured the near unanimous consensus of the political class and the media in this country. The Israeli-Palestinian conflict is intractable 
too complex to solve. It is not. The root of Israeli-Palestinian conflict is simple. It's about justice. Each of the three religions to whom the Holy Land is sacred profess that each human life is endowed by God with infinite worth and untouchable dignity. That's why the Declaration of, the, of Independence of the United States declares that every human being has certain inalienable rights, among them life, liberty, and the pursuit of justice, a uh, pursuit of happiness. The violation of any of these fundamental human rights against any human being must be called what it is, injustice, plain and simple. We must call it what it is, injustice, when human beings are denied the freedom to practice their religion as they wish. We must call it what it is, injustice, when human beings have their ancestral hand, land confiscated. We must call it what it is, injustice, when human beings have to watch as their home is bulldozed. We have to call it what it is, injustice, when human beings are denied freedom of movement. We must call it what it is, injustice, when human beings are confined to an open-air prison like in Gaza. We must call it what it is, injustice, when the life of children is snuffed out by bombs raining from the sky. Each of these we would call gross human rights violations and injustices here in the United States. Unless we are hypocrites, we must use the same moral standard for Israel and Palestine. The Israeli-Palestinian conflict is not intractable, not too complex to solve. It will be solved on the day when Israelis and Palestinians will both enjoy their inalienable rights, among them life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. May God speed the coming of that day. Thank you. My name is Dr. Eric Greenberg. That's uh, with an A as in alpha, A-R-I-K. Greenberg is G-R-E-E-N-B-E-R-G. -E -E and I'm uh, faculty of uh, theological studies at Loyola Marymount University. And I'm also the founder and president of the Institute for Religious Tolerance, Peace, and Justice based in Los Angeles. And I want to say how grateful I am to have been invited to this. So thank you. Salam. Um, the Institute for Religious Tolerance, Peace, and Justice uh, leads a, an interfaith solidarity march here in Los Angeles every year. And we also lead, we are the lead organization of an international coalition of interfaith marches called the Interfaith March for Peace and Justice. This will become pertinent in a moment. When I was growing up, I always noticed that if a fight broke out between two kids, a mob would always form around them, urging them on, shouting, fight, fight, some even taking sides. This is the lowest form of humanity the most base and despicable reaction that we can have. And as grown-ups, I still see people doing this, and I've been watching social media for the last couple of days, mm -hmm. and people retreating to their corners, taking sides, rooting for Israel, or rooting for Palestine, as if this were a boxing match, as if one could ever actually win a war without losing everything, including one's righteousness. Do I have an easy solution to the problems between Israelis and Palestinians? No, I do not. But this is not the way. Jerusalem is a holy place for all three Abrahamic faiths. The sanctity of the location must be maintained and kept free of violence. Those of us here in Los Angeles, people of every faith and elsewhere around the world must stand together and demand a ceasefire and demand justice. Rather than taking the side of one combatant over another, we must take the side of peace, the side of God 
as people of faith, as people of goodwill from the three, Abra excuse me, three Abrahamic faiths, cousins all of us, children of the same God and children of Abraham, it is our responsibility to say to the adversaries who are lobbing rockets at each other while innocent bystanders are caught in the crossfire, enough. Now, one of the two dozen member marches that are part of our global interfaith march community that I mentioned earlier, one of these is a group in Bethlehem, in Palestine, led by my friend Mohammed Jamus, just a wonderful young hum human being. And I've gotten to know him over the last few years, working with him to help coordinate his local march in the Holy Land. And he is a beautiful human being, and I want him and his family to be safe. His new bride, he just got married recently. His precious little niece, who I met over Zoom while, while conversing with Muhammad. His elderly mother, who recently survived COVID. And the rest of his family. I could not imagine if anything were to happen to him or his loved ones. But he's in the thick of it, in the line of fire. And just yesterday, he posted on social media, quote, the situation in the Holy Land is now like a battlefield. All cities are on fire. And I remember reading that and thinking, this is, this is somebody witnessing this. And we need to listen. This is my friend. And he is a Palestinian. And he is a Muslim. He does not represent Hamas. He is not a terrorist. He is an innocent bystander and the breadwinner of a large family that has been in desperation for well over the last year. He has actually been out of work for about a year, doing whatever he can to support this large family. I don't know how he manages. But Muhammad, my friend, has informed us that the city of prophets is under attack. But it is not by earthly forces, but by ignorance and hatred itself. The God of Jacob, the God of Israel, the God of Muhammad, speaks to us in all his holy scriptures and demands peace. And as it says in the Gospel of Luke, chapter 11, verse 51, Jesus of Nazareth proclaimed, as a result, this generation will be charged with the blood of all the prophets that has been shed since the foundation of the world, from the blood of Abel to the blood of Zechariah, who was killed between the altar and the sanctuary. Yes, I tell you, all of it will be charged to this generation. That was his demand. The blood of the innocent in Jerusalem will not be forgotten by God. And right now, I am specifically talking about Palestinian blood. Make peace in the Holy Land. Make peace everywhere. It is our time to stand together as a community that we have here and say no more. Be at peace. I stand with my friend Mohammed Jamus. I stand with peace. And I stand with my friends here of each of the Abrahamic faiths to assert the right of worship of all to worship safely and freely, and that Palestinian lives do matter. Good morning. My name is Daryl Myers, D-A-R-R-E-L, Myers, M-E-Y-E-R-S. I'm a retired Presbyterian minister in the original founder of the Middle East Fellowship of Southern California and a member of Friends of Seville. The last time I was in Palestine was a year and a half ago in Bethlehem. And it reminded me of when I was there several years ago back in the 80s. When one could look up at the hills right next to the city in Har Homa, one place where people could actually go to have recreation. Now, they're all settlements all around Bethlehem. And when I left Bethlehem for the last time of my 27 trips there in December of 2019, to learn that 85% of Bethlehem is now under occupation of settlements. What do you do when your home is no longer there? I was in Sheikh Jarrah, which is now being so much elevated 13 years ago, 
when members basically of the same family in the same locale were moved out by settlers from their homes. And so what has been said here before is that nothing new is happening, only it's getting much worse. I spoke with a, pre a professor at Hebrew University yesterday who was just almost beside herself about what was happening. I never heard her so ineloquent about what was happening. I spoke with a person in Bethany yesterday, right? 60 yards, a football throw to the tomb of Lazarus. And how are things going there, Kifa? Miserable, 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 she said. So this is the human story. And it's time that we start listening, as we've been saying, that the Palestinian people are human beings too. I end up with one last reference. In, 2000, in 1994, I visited Gaza for a few days my last trip there, and it was out on the beach. For the first time in 25 years, the kids were able to play by the beach and the people were able to go, not being restricted to go maybe two blocks from their home to the beach, which is so beautiful at that time. And it was so memorable about what it meant to feel free, even though it was 1994, and that was before they were all penned in, as they have been in the world's biggest prison. Thank God for the voices that are speaking out. Thank God for the Jewish and Israeli voices that are speaking out against this injustice against the Palestinians. And as a Christian, I remind you that Christians in Palestine are also standing with their Palestinian Muslim brothers and sisters and saying, we are for justice and peace. We want to be free. Thank you. Good morning. Um, I'm Rabbi Neil Comis Daniels. I am the Emeritus Rabbi at Death Cure Shalom in Santa Monica. And I can't agree more with everything that my friends and colleagues have said. But I want to do tell you a story, as many of us have, from our trips to the land that is holy for so many of us. One of my earliest times in Israel, I was able to visit the Al-Aqsa Mosque. Like so many thousands of Palestinians have not been able to at the end of Ramadan. And I entered that space, and it was not prayer time. It was just me and the rugs. It was just me and that space. And I felt welcomed. I felt embraced. I felt that I was in the right place. I felt that it was holy ground, as holy as any ground I'd been on. One of the best prayer spaces I'd ever entered. And to feel that that space is now a contentious boiling point for these two peoples who have been striving against one another for so long. You know, we live in the present. We cannot help but live in the present. And we can do little about the past except to move towards the future. And what Salam demonstrated to us when he showed us those, those maps of the progression of the, 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 the geopolitics of Israel and Palestine. I wish that we could have come up with something that would have indeed been more equitable a long time ago and we're not there. We're only now. And now is the time for the Israelis and the Palestinians not to lose another chance to leap higher. To leap beyond everything that's gone before. There is no justice, no civility in this civil war when the Israeli military and police <coughs> act the way they do to Palestinians, treating them as less than human, treating them with indignity, treating them 
as things. There is nothing civil about missiles being lobbed into Israel indiscriminately to go anywhere and kill. There is nothing civil about Hamas hiding itself near schools and hospitals. And there is nothing civil about Jews claiming the rights to the entire land and displacing holy human beings from their homes that they lived in for generations. What are we doing? This is indeed the definition of insanity. Insanity is doing the same thing over and over and expecting a different result. There needs to be a different process. There needs to be a coming together. The United States needs to wield its power to calm things down, not to say that one side is superior to the other and one side deserves more defense than the other. In fact, the United States needs to decide that there are no sides, that there is just this place with two peoples with their integrity with two peoples who deserve their sovereignty, with two peoples who deserve to live as they are, who they are, side by side. It's time for Ishmael and Isaac to come back together. As they did only once for the burial of their father. But now they should come together for life, for rebirth of something new, something precious that we'll never lose hold of again. Thank you. My name is Umar Hakim, U M A R H A K. That's Day, Umar Hakim Day. I am the director for Intellect, Love, and Mercy Foundation. Over the last 30 days, we've been involved with the third pillar of Islam, fasting for the month of Ramadan. This month is dedicated to reflection on the principles of God, reflection on humanity, reflection on ourselves to ensure peace. First, within ourselves. On the, on the 25th night of Ramadan, in the 25th night of Ramadan, in the 25th night of Ramadan, worshipers were attacked. The mosque, the synagogue, the church, is a safe space for believers. Imagine yourself in your safe space, scared to go back outside because now someone is attacking you. As a black man in America, I understand what oppression is. As the husband of a South African woman, I understand what oppression is. As an African American Muslim, I understand what oppression is. In June 2017, nine worshipers were killed in a safe space, safe space in Charleston, I believe it's North Car North Carolina. South Carolina. Nine worshipers killed in a safe space. Is there a correlation there? Yes. The ideology of violence, solving a problem with violence. So, President Biden, Vice President Kamala, wherever the Constitution dollars go, the principles of pursuing happiness should follow that. We're all, whether you're a cameraman, whether you're a Muslim, a Christian, or, or Jewish, we're all seeking what is called tikkun olam. We're all seeking to establish weight with justice and fall not short in the balance. We're all seeking health, security, and protection. 
So I'm asking the presidential cabinet administration to ensure that Palestinians have a right to their homes. Our constitution ensures that for us, because if that was here in the United States, we would be charged with a home invasion. A home invasion when you break the perimeter of someone's home and violate their dignity and take from them. We have to ensure no more home invasions occur anywhere in the world. We have to ensure that anywhere in the world, the governments are providing health, security, and protection. So I'm asking the people of the world to stand in solidarity with Palestine and help the people, help the governments understand. I'm going to leave you with this. In our book, The Holy Quran, which is the divine speech of God, it says, I'm going to paraphrase it, to save a life is like saving the life of all humanity. To save a life is like saving the life of all humanity. I don't know the Palestinian woman, the older lady, but she's like my grandmother. I only met my grandmother once in my life. If that life could have been saved, or we could save the next life, that would inspire change around the world. My name is Umar Hakeem Day, Intellect, Love, and Mercy Foundation. Thank you. Thank you, everybody. Let's all gather as close as comfortable as you, as you would like. Uh, let's gather for one prayer. Please. You can go ahead, come, come, come around the podium if you're comfortable with, with that. You can come as close to the podium as possible. Because we represent three different faiths, and we believe that it is the will of God that our faiths become one in pursuing the one God. We ask God Almighty that we bring human dignity back to the soul of America. The body of America is great. It is the spirit of America that we ask you to infuse with your spirit, O God Almighty. We ask you to unite our hearts even though we cannot be together in our houses of worship because of the pandemic. We ask you to unite our hearts in praying together, collectively, to bring justice. We ask you, O oh God Almighty, to unite us with all who stand for righteousness, for the truth, those who abstain from evil, those who strive in your cause, and those who give generously to your cause, which is the cause of peace. It is the cause of mercy. It is the cause of justice. It is the cause of compassion. It is the cause of restoring human dignity. We have that power that you have given us as human beings, O oh God Almighty. We ask you to strengthen our resolve and our direction towards your cause together, O oh God Almighty. Thank you very much for coming together on this great day, Eid al-Fitr for Muslims. It's the completion of 30 days of fasting. And now that I can have my coffee <laughs> in the morning and uh, pastries, I ask you to join us in that celebration. Uh, and uh, I thank you. I thank you for, for all being toge uh, together today. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you.